without any further ado, John Cleese. Uh, yeah. Uh, the awful thing about getting old is that I have to say to Jason, I want to sit on this side because this is my good ear. <laughs> Sad, isn't it? <laughs> it's not so bad getting old. It's not so bad. Well, it beats the alternative? It beats the alternative. And also, as you get older, you realize it... Uh, as somebody once said to me, he was a general in the British Army, he said, uh, um, very little matters much, and most things don't matter at all. And I think now that that's sunk in, I think it's hard when you're younger to, to realize that, but very little matters, really. <laughs> and um, that's why I can look at the current political scene here and in the rest of the world and have a good giggle about it. <laughs> I suppose the alternative is bursting into tears. <laughs> now, Jason, your name is an anagram of Sonia. Did you know that? I, I think that's where my parents got it from. <laughs> yes, Good. Uh, that's Good what they tell answer. me, I think. Um, the, I was gonna, you, are, you often get philosophical about life, and I was going to ask you, what does it all mean? Oh, um, oh, you, you made a movie. Yeah, I made a movie. If you recall, the called The Meaning of Life. I uh, remember. It sounds maybe like you've revised some of those theories since then. I remember doing an interview on Danish television once live. Of course, they speak perfect English. And um, they, well, one of them said to me, um, what, what would you, well, What's the meaning of life? And I said, It was really interesting you should ask that because I actually realized it this morning. <laughs> and he said, What? I said, yes, it was uh, just after breakfast. I had this moment of absolute revelation. He said, well, can you tell us? I said, no, I've forgotten it now. <laughs> <laughs> he really believed me. Oh, that was one of them. <laughs> I think the main thing is to understand that happiness or adjustment is much more an emotional state than an uh, intellectual state. And uh, I think that any kind of practice that's vaguely meditational or uh, even not as effective, but still uh, therapy. I think the more that we have a disrespectful attitude towards our own egos, I think the happier life becomes. And I think the great problem of growing up at the moment, particularly for young people, is that you're told that if you're not rich and famous, your life is not really worthwhile. And that is such pernicious crap. Hmm. Yeah? So. I think it's interesting that, that you find introspection and meditation so important because you've made your name and career partly for mm. performance. And so how do you think show business and performance fits into all of this? Well, I, th I think that you can be, um, somebody once said to me, you can be an introverted exhibitionist. And I think there's truth in that. But I think on the whole, uh, very few people are purely extrovert or purely introvert. The American. Um, society is, is, is much more extroverted. Um, and I don't think Americans are aware of that. But there's an absolutely fabulous book called Quiet. It's a completely white cover. It's written by a woman called Susan Cain, C-A-I-N. And it's called Quiet, and it's about being an introvert. And I read that three years ago, and it was very helpful to me because in an extroverted society, you can start feeling that there's something a bit wrong with you if you're an introvert. Um, I don't believe that at all. I think if you sat down with Jesus and the Buddha, you'd find that they were both introverts. And extroverted va values, which are to do with fame and, and, and money and status and positions, these are all things you have no control over. Do you see what I mean? Whereas you have a certain amount of control over your inner life because you can somehow, you can not control your thoughts, but you can decide how much energy to give to a specific thought. That was a bit profound. Wasn't it? <laughs> this is exactly how I saw this going. Yeah. Uh, oh dear, is that a bad thing? <laughs> Sonia, come <Yeah>. on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so, how early can you trace back this sort of philosophy on life? Um, I know that. Which you're, bit? Well, the the. <laughs> the quiet stillness, the introversion. I know that you did, I'll say your experiences in childhood yeah. were not necessarily 
Oh, no, I was not gregarious at all because my parents were older parents. Mm -hmm. Dad was 46 when I was born and, and Mum was 40 and that was a lot in 1939, you know. And uh, we moved continuously. I mean, during the war, we were bombed um, just a few months after I was born. And my father, who'd fought the First World War, was out of there like a shot. Some people say, well, what are you running away for? And he said, well, if you're going to run away, then do it quickly. Don't do it. <laughs> and we went and I started life on a farm. And we moved house 13 times in 14 years or something ridiculous. So I didn't have a chance to make very close friendships with friends because the moment I got to know someone, we moved. And when I went to school, I, d I didn't fit in very well. But I'd spent a lot of my life amusing myself, playing little games on my own with my stuffed animals, you know. And Sammy Davis Jr. once said that he thought boredom was a great help to creativity. Because when you start getting bored without a constant external stimulation, that's when stuff starts coming up from the inside, which is really what, what creativity is about. I, I'm very interested in creativity because no one ever spotted I had any till I was 22. And when I, when, I, when I think back, I think, well, that was a, a big comment on the educational system in Britain at the time, because I remember being told to write an essay on time, and it was quite a long essay. And I wrote it about how I didn't have time to write the essay. <laughs> you see what you mean? It's just quite neat for a 17-year-old. Uh, but nobody ever said, oh, you have ability in this area. So when I started to uh, discover at Cambridge I could write stuff that made people laugh, then I began to watch the process, and I'm quite convinced that anything of importance creatively comes up from the unconscious. Uh, and there's a lot of very, very bright, highly intellectual, immensely smart people, but they're left brain, and they'll never, I think, be very, um, very creative. And Albert Einstein said the most extraordinary things, like he said that um, muscular feelings were a major part of his creative process. I mean, that surprises people. But when, 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 you, when your unconscious gives you an idea, it doesn't give it neatly printed out on a piece of paper. It, it'll just give you an image or a feeling or something. And if you can stay with that and move around, eventually it'll make, make sense. Like a guy called Kukuli von Stradenitz who invented or discovered, I mean, the structure of the carbon atom. Um, he, he had been working on it for years, and one day he was dozing and looking into the fire, and as he was dozing, like this, he started watching the flames, and he had this little image that they were snakes, these, and that they were biting their own tails, you see. Carbon atom. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? And, and uh, <laughs> it's not a direct, not it's a carbon atom. You see what I mean? But you just get an image of a snake. So it's very indirect, the information you get from your unconscious, because there's so much information down there. I mean, there was a very interesting experiment. Some psychologists showed uh, a group of people um, some Chinese ideograms, ca uh, characters. And they came back next week and they said to the people, now we're going to show you some more. Some of the ones you saw last week, some are new. Will you tell us which ones you saw last week? And they were absolutely hopeless. Nobody could do it at all. It was exactly chance. And then they repeated the experiment. The second time, they said on the second um, showing, we're going to show you um, some more ideograms. Will you tell us which ones you like? And the ones they liked were the ones they'd seen the week before. So that the information was in there, in the unconscious, but it couldn't be accessed in a straightforward way. That's, I think it. <laughs> but I, I want people to know that because you guys are in a very creative business and you have to learn how to contact your unconscious and use it. And what I spend a lot of time doing is teaching people that you've got to be quiet. You can't have a creative idea where you're rushing around answering your cell phone, looking at your watch, sending off email. It's not going to happen. You've got to get quieter. And uh, Edison, who I think has more patents than any other American in history, he had an extraordinary way of working. He would sit and he would hold ball bearings in his hand and he would have a metal plate down there, a metal bowl. 
because he thought he got his best ideas in that sort of hinterland between being awake and actually being asleep. And the well, well, reason he did that is that as he fell asleep, he would drop the ball bearings into the metal bowl and they would wake him up again and he'd pick it up and go. And he liked to stay in that very, very dreamy state because that's when he got his most, most of his ideas. Right. Uh, um, the reason I hesitated before is because I find it so interesting that j um, the link you make between left brain and right brain because yeah. I know growing up you were quite good at mathematics. Oh, I was all left brain. Yeah. No, I was completely left brain. I was good at maths. I was good at Latin. I got into Cambridge on science and switched to law. You don't get any more left brain than that. Right. And, and so um, what happened then that, that suddenly you well, I started just, doing this? I just thing? discovered that I could write sketches that made people laugh. And I discovered that at Cambridge. I mean, I knew I had a facility for making my classmates laugh, but that's when I discovered it. And then as I went on and on and on, uh, I, I was very lucky because early on I met a professor of psychology from Sussex called Brian Bates. And Brian told me that the best bit of research that had ever been done was done in America at Berkeley in the late 60s. No. Yes, the 60s, by a guy called McKinnon, who was fascinated by uh, creativity in, not in creative people, so-called, but in, in professions, journalism, engineers. Uh, but he was particularly interested in architects, because architects have got to be good at the creativity, but they've also got to be good at the left brain stuff, so that the buildings actually stay up after they look nice. Yeah. You see what I mean? And what, what he, he went around all the architects and said, who are the creative ones? And he got a list of names. And then he went and talked to them and said, what do you do from the moment you get up in the morning to the moment you go to bed at night? And they told him. And then he went off and asked the uncreative architects. Of course, he didn't tell them. <laughs> <laughs> that was why he was asking them. What do you do? First thing you get up, go to bed. And what he discovered, there were two huge differences between the creative ones and the uncreative ones. And the, the huge differences were, one, the creative architects knew how to play. And he said that the play was almost childlike. Because when you see children really absorbing something, thinking, you know, what's going to happen if I pull this wing off, you know? <laughs> or not? And if I pull this leg, what will it, you see what I mean? And there's no sense of time, you know? It's sort of eternal, and they're completely absorbed in it because they're interested in it for its own sake, not because they have to solve it in order to move on. And they had this ability to play. And the other thing, which will probably surprise you, was that they deferred taking decisions as long as they could. And people are surprised because the whole uh, idea of the efficient executive is someone who's like this. No, it's bullshit. When you have to have, when you have to have a take it to make a decision, what do you say? You say take or make. 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 When you have to make a decision, uh, the first question you've got to ask yourself is when does this uh, question have to be answered? And then you answer it then. But you don't answer it before for two reasons. One is you may get new information. Well, that's obvious. But the other is the longer you leave it, the more chance your unconscious has of coming up with some stuff. You see what I mean? Yeah. So it's, a, it's, a, it's take your time. But of course, it's a real world. So if somebody says, I need to know by 3 o'clock, then you've got to give them an answer by 3 o'clock. But if somebody says, we want you to work on this, then most people want to sort it out and come up with an answer because being in a state of limbo leaves you slightly anxious. You haven't resolved it. You know, you'd like to say, kick, get on with that. And if you don't resolve it, if you stay with that, that uncertainty, the lack of resolution, then you'll come up with better answers in the end. And that's the other thing McKinnon said about the creative architects is they could tolerate that sense of dissatisfaction when you can't actually solve something yet. You, you talk some about the creative process, both here and in the book, and um, you mentioned getting your start at Cambridge mm. in terms of performing with the footlights. And that's also around the time you started developing a creative process with Graham Chapman, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what your process was like and how it changed over the years? Yes. Well, when I first sat down with Gray, I was the engine room. 
I was the one who pushed it forward. And Gray would sit there puffing on his pipe, staring out of the window. And every now and again, he would throw something in. And it was always off the wall or didn't quite follow from what had been going before. So I tended to get too sucked into a left, left brain. I know those terms are very rough, but you know, from Sperry and all that. But I mean, basically, it does mean something. I would get sucked into that, and I'd become a little bit predictable because I was so logical. And Graham is the one who would say, um, I don't know, bananas or something. You'd say, oh, why? why oh, I, oh, that's interesting. So it worked very well because the, the great thing about a team is that the members of the team need to have completely different skills, not the same ones. There's no point in having a team if people have the same skills. One of the things that creativity psychologists have discovered is that if you put a lot of middle-aged white men together to, um, and give them a creative problem, then they will report afterwards what a, what a profitable experience it was, how much they enjoyed it, how much they'd <laughs> like to do it in the future, and it was all totally worthwhile, and they'd come up with fuck all. <laughs> so Congress is what you're saying. Yeah, well, uh, the, the, thing, <laughs> the thing is, that's very good. <laughs> fuck all. Anyway, you go. <laughs> I didn't mean to steal your... No, 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 no. I forgot what I was going to say. This happens because I'm, I'm very tired. I've been traveling for six weeks. I've done 30 shows in 40 days. And, uh, that, that's, that's just the stage shows. I mean, I'm doing Stephen Colbert tonight. Wow. I get, I get to where... I didn't, I didn't get this before when I told them that I was going to be in a... <laughs> well, Colbert has asked me to do the furry hat with him. Do you know about the furry hat? So I'm being proud. I'm proud. I'm the first person to do the fairy hat. So I'm looking to him, which means you, ma you make stupid pronouncements. You know? Okay. <laughs> so where were we? Can you remember? Graham Chapman in the process of writing. Yes. Well, he was, you see, and we worked well together because we complemented each mm -hmm. other. But we also, which really helped, had exactly the same sense of humor. Right. And when you start writing comedy, you're always wondering to yourself, is this, gonna, is this funny? I don't, I, and then you laugh, and then you look at it again and think, ooh, I'm not sure it is funny. And what I discovered with Gray is that if Gray laughed, it was funny. <laughs> the audience would laugh. And it was extraordinarily lucky to find someone like that because it was like the big solution, big question, is it funny? He answered it. Mm. Did you wonder that while you were writing this book? Because there, it is not meant to be just comedy, but it's quite funny. Uh, oh, I'm trying to be as funny as I can. And I, did, you, uh, did you worry at all that it wasn't funny? With, with uh, well, no, I thought it's all right, provided it's fun. I don't have to make people laugh all the time, provided I make them laugh some of the time, because that's their expectation. So uh, when I was writing the book, I kind of thought sometimes, well, this has been a bit serious for a bit, so I'll now make it lighter. But it's very interesting being, uh, being interviewed about the book. Nobody says it's funny. They ask about your relationship with your mother and all this kind of stuff, because that's what journalists write about. And then I say at the end, what did you think? They say, oh, they thought it was hilarious. I said, well, could you say so? Well, I thought it was hilarious. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sonia. And I already, I put down the card that had the question about your mother on it, so we won't, we don't need to get into that. Well, I don't mind doing it, because there's a lot of humor in the, in the question. But what I mean is there's certain things that journalists want to write about. There's a guy called Sir David Hare who writes very good plays, but I never thought they were as good as everyone else, although I like the man immensely, and he's very bright. And I said to someone, why is he so successful? And a journalist said, oh, he writes plays about all the things that journalists want to write about. <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> uh, um, you haven't always gotten on well with the journalists, especially in Britain, right? Oh, what a rabble. <laughs> They're, they're as stupid as the Republican candidates for the president. <laughs> and, and, act, and, and a lot more unpleasant. Because <laughs> I, I mean, it is extraordinary what's going on at the moment, isn't it? When I came here in 64, I was so impressed by everything American. I was here for 18 months. And you were more efficient, you were more thoughtful, you were better organized, everything was better. New York Times, the best newspaper I've read. And um, now it's, it's almost the opposite, because what I admired in 64 was that, you, that the um, Democrats and the Republicans, they had friendships across the aisle. They could talk to each other, they could do business. 
And it was so different from England, where the Labour or Socialists and the Conservatives were always brilliant. And now you've got exactly what we had in the mid-60s. I mean, what do you do about it? The answer is democracy has failed. <laughs> and some people, when I say that, go, <gasps> it's clearly failed because it's predicated on an intelligent and well-informed electorate. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist here. It doesn't exist in England. So I kind of think, what's, what's next? A benevolent dictatorship, I hope. <laughs> or even a malevolent dictatorship. I mean, Are you putting yourself forward as a candidate? I'm too old. No, too old. I'm too old. And I wouldn't, I, I, <laughs> I don't care about anything anymore. You, <laughs> it's lovely. You know you're going to be dead. But maybe that's exactly who we need. Well, Reagan was a bit like that. I mean, <laughs> People have forgotten this, but I'm so old I can remember that when Reagan started his press conferences, the American press corps were astonished at his ignorance. And they were scandalized by it. They started to write about it, and the readership did not want to hear this. So after a time, they stopped writing about it, because it was a time after you'd had a series of very ineffectual um, presidents, or maybe unlucky presidents. And they wanted to have someone in there that made them feel comfortable, you know, somebody who's nice and in charge and it's fine, we can forget about it all. And so the fact that he was so ignorant was hushed up eventually by the press as a matter of policy. But in England, I mean, we just have the worst press I've ever come across. I mean, the Daily Mail is the very worst. <laughs> but when you consider that a woman called Rebecca Brooks was on trial for all sorts of illegal acts, but mostly to do with hacking, that she was on trial, she'd been editor of the News of the World after Andy Coulson. She was on trial with Andy Coulson. Andy Coulson was found guilty of uh, hacking and being aware of all the malignant practices that were going on at the time. She was his lover over quite a long course of time. She had ordered her staff to delete three million air. Uh, uh, three million emails, and at the end of it all, she was found innocent. She's guilty as hell. And there was such an outcry, she was withdrawn from Britain. She's now been put back in there by Rupert Murdoch in charge of his four main titles. And the woman is certainly um, a sociopath. I mean, dresses... Um, addresses her, her, her employees as cunts and fucking cunts through telephones at people and completely unscrupulous, saying to people things like, if you don't get this story, you're fired. Well, of course they're going to go off and break the law, you know? It's like Hitler or Himmler saying, oh, we had no idea about the SS, you know? We, we knew they didn't really like some people, but you know, <laughs> we had no idea they were doing nasty things to them. All this going on behind our back. Anyway, moving forward, because we got enough of this Monday night quarterbacking, you know? <laughs> Who hasn't made a few mistakes. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> mistakes were made. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> It's a book called that. I've just bought it. Yes, I've read it. It's quite Have you? good, actually. Yes. Oh, um, all right. We'll talk about that later. The ending. So what else can I say that will bore these people? To well, do? you mentioned Ronald Reagan, his counterpart in Britain, Margaret Thatcher. Mm -hmm. um, I've read, and is it true, that she put on a performance of the parrot sketch? <laughs> You're right. Was that a good segue back into... It was very good because that's exactly what she did. She, uh, she was uh, advised by her colleagues that it would be nice to have a little humor in her speech and she wanted to say that the Liberal Democrat Party, which incidentally I support, um, was dead and finished and she did the parrot sketch and I knew her foreign affairs advisor, Charles Powell, very well and he said the hours we spent rehearsing. <laughs> she still just couldn't do it. <laughs> and that's fascinating, isn't it, that somebody that bright, because she was very bright, I mean, she was mad, but she was bright, <laughs> um, that somebody that bright just, just had no idea how to do it. Um, it's funny. But I'll tell you something else about the sketch, because I told this this morning. Absolutely true, this story. I'd done the sketch on tour, Monty Python tour, with uh, Michael Palin, and we came off just before the end of the show doing that as the finale. And I saw an anxious and earnest young man standing in the wings. And he said, 
I said, yeah. He said, Mr. Cleese, can I ask you something? I said, yes. He said, the parrot sketch. He said, it is about the Vietnam War, isn't it? <laughs> is that one? <laughs> no, we all know it's about Korea. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's the Boer War, but you <laughs> don't know about that. Um, so the parrot sketch, it, everyone knows this. It's one of the most well-known and hilarious bits from Monty Python, and you've mentioned um, in the process of creating these things, you're always wondering, is this funny? Are people going to like it? Mm. When you look back at your career, which you've done through the process of writing this book, what are the pieces that you'd say, gosh, the answer to that question was no. Like, that really wasn't that funny, and I wish I could go back. <laughs> well, I think you sometimes you just make things that aren't any good, and, and, and particularly with movies, it's not that surprising, because you assemble a team of 30 people like that who may not know each other very well. And whether there's good chemistry, as there was on Fish Called Wonder or not, is really it's a toss-up. You can't control that kind of thing. And also, there's so many of the people in charge of movies have no idea what they're doing. There's a fellow, I'm a phony professor at Cornell, and I sometimes do psychology stuff with a lovely professor there called David Dunning. And David has discovered something that's very relevant. He's discovered that in order to know how good you are at something, requires almost exactly the same skills and aptitudes as it does to actually be good at it. Which means that if you're absolutely no good at something, you lack exactly the skills and aptitudes that you need to know that you're no good at it. <laughs> now that's tremendously funny, I think. <laughs> The worse you are, the less chance you have of knowing how good you are at something. And that explains a lot of life, but particularly the Hollywood studios. <laughs> because these people have no idea what they're doing. But they have absolutely no idea that they have no idea what they're doing. And that just fills them with confidence. And that's the, that's the dangerous <laughs> thing. It's, it's a confidence mixed with the anxiety over not feeling... Oh, and the anxiety. And I think at a deep level, they actually know they don't know, but they can never, they can never say that. I remember sitting in the office of an of a, of a executive in Disney, and I'd written a script which she'd said, we don't get first drafts like this. This is 75% of the way there. And then she started telling me what we wanted to do with the script. And I said to her, I, let me explain. I cannot do that because I don't know how to sit down at my desk to make the script worse. <laughs> you see what I mean? I don't know how you do that. I suppose you have lots of ideas, and then you say, that's the worst one, so let's do that. <laughs> so I walked away from the movie. But they have no idea what they're doing. If you ever have another project like that, I'm sure I could help <laughs> make it worse. Right. Um, you mentioned A Fish Called Wanda. Mm -hmm. It's one of your biggest successes, especially in films. Um, you're working on a musical? Well, I'm working on a musical. I wrote the first, uh, the first uh, draft of the book, the story, the dialogue with my lovely, lovely daughter. Um, and uh, we'll have to, the trouble is we're trying to do a deal with MGM because they own the rights and of course they want 99% of everything. So I don't know if that will work, but I'd love to do a musical. I mean, I'm actually terrible. I mean, I'm so bad at singing and anything musical that when I actually got into a Broadway musical uh, by accident, I was told by the musical director not to sing. <laughs> he said, just learn the lines and mime. I'm that bad at music, but I would like to do music because that, that's not an experience I've ever had. And I've actually just been offered a, um, a possible sitcom here in America, very offbeat, the sort of um, Larry David type of thing. Oh. So that's around, and I've also recently adapted a wonderful French farce. Now, you Americans, I think you don't know so much about French farces. It's not so much of your um, culture as it is in England. But this, the one I've adapted, was written in 1890 by a guy called Georges Fado. And it's better constructed than any comedy I've seen in the last 20 years. They understood in those days how to create these wonderfully complex plots that were almost like bits of clockwork. You know what I mean? And they're just superbly created. So I've pinched that because uh, it's out of copyright. 
<laughs> and, and I've turned that into a stage play. So I've got various things okay, going. You've yeah. got some things going. Do you find yourself watching television these days? No, no. I don't. And I'll tell you why, because I've realized, I think I have become extremely wise because <laughs> No, seriously, because um, uh, uh, Plato said that, uh, that uh, Socrates said that wisdom was really knowing how little you know. And I sincerely believe now that I know almost nothing. And I think that I'm sitting in a room with people who do think they know things. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, and I'm very skeptical about it all, I think. <laughs> I think we don't know anything important. And what if you follow the history of science, it's terribly funny that scientists keep announcing either that they've discovered something or they're very, very close to discovering something, except it never happens. There was a, a professor, a, 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 a philosopher, a, sorry, a guy called Karl Popper, who was the, the best, uh, I think, the best um, philosopher of science of the last century. And he called it promissory materialism, which is it's going to be there any moment, but just, you know, and then I remember the AI stuff coming 15 years ago. Oh, we're just from the edge of cracking. What is that noise? It must be construction. Oh, really? Oh, I thought it was a microphone. Um, <laughs> And, and he said, and, and uh, you see, I, I don't, he, he said that, uh, that scientific um, progress is all about falsification. That if you can't falsify something, then you can't prove it either. Do you see what I mean? Right. If you have a theory, that theory has got to be tested and is falsifiable. And I think people don't understand that, and they constantly think. That, that scientists are, are, are cracking it, and they're never cracking it. They're just improving things bit by bit. But often, they go down an absolutely completely wrong road. I mean, there was a physicist called Lord Kelvin, who, I think it was about 1898, yes, I think it was 1898, announced that all the problems in physics had now been solved that were important and that all they were doing now was arguing about the fourth decimal point, right? That was seven years before Einstein discovered relativity. And that world, the predictable materialist world, fell apart. But they were absolutely convinced that they were there. And I think that's the question now. I was talking to a very clever man called Rupert Sheldrake recently, and he said they're now trying to replicate a lot of experiments that have been done that um, are not replicated. That 60% of the experiments in social science that have been part of the knowledge of social science, they, they're not able to replicate them. And a smaller percentage, like 45, is true of medical research. So everything's beginning to change. There are all sorts of odd theories out there. Maybe the physical laws of the universe evolve. And I think we don't know, you see. But what I notice about scientists is they don't want to know about the philosophy of science. You know, they want to just do science. You must say, but you don't want to examine your own assumptions. There's an extraordinary arrogance there. I once had dinner with Stephen Jay Gould, right? You know him? Famous, famous biologist. And I was chatting to him. I don't know, you're a bit arrogant, but I liked him. And I said, <laughs> I said to him, oh, what are you doing? And he told me about four books that he was about to write, and he knew exactly what was in the book. And I said, now, if God called you into his office, Stephen, and, and he sat you down and said, you can ask me one question about something that's been puzzling you all your life, and you would love to understand it, what would it be? And Gould said, I can't think of one. <laughs> this is a scientist. You're obviously unimpressed. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that is absolutely appalling. And so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of deliberately needling you guys because I think you've got to understand that we don't know as much as we think we know. I'm waiting for a moment when somebody in a white coat one day stands up and says, we scientists now know that we know less than we thought. <laughs> Re results show. <laughs> Yes, well, Rupert Murdoch, uh, Rupert Murdoch, <laughs>
Rupert Sheldrake and I are, are, are working on something there to, 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 to tease scientists to be a little less sure about what they're doing. For example, the professor of psychology emeritus at, at Cornell has, has done an experiment and it has been replicated, and it's very similar to one done by a guy called Dean Ravings, uh, Ray, Dean Radin, at the um, Institute of Noetic Sciences across the bridge in San Francisco. And what Dean did, which is a very simple version of the experiment, is he sat people down in front of a television screen, and he showed them three categories of, of, of pictures. He showed them pictures that were of everyday objects like a telephone or a glass of water or a, a, a boot. Then he showed them nice, very slightly pornographic thing, but nothing hard or shocking, just rather sort of sexy, nice, warm, makes you feel, hmm, you know, sort of pictures. <laughs> and then he had a series of pictures of things like accidents and operations that make people go, and he would send these pictures into the room where the subject was sitting looking at them on the screen. And what he discovered, because the subjects were wired up with that sort of um, lie detection, so if you know how the, what is it? Uh, when, the, when you sweat the, re the um, uh, resistance of the, well, what's it called? Oh? Um? Yes, that's right. The, uh, <laughs> And what he discovered was that about two seconds before they saw the nasty pictures, they started to sweat. There was no way that they could have known what picture was coming up. They didn't sweat if they were going to get a nice picture. Well, they were generated randomly. Now, you can't explain that. And this is a professor who carries it out and other people have replicated it. So there's an awful lot going on for, oh, somebody's leaving. <laughs> Bye, have a nice lunch. <laughs> there's an awful lot going on that I think we think we know about and we don't. And you guys are particularly prone to it because you do highly, highly intellectual work, you know. Don't forget the right brain. Don't forget that instinctive thing because if you read what Nobel science, uh, Nobel Prize winner, winning scientists say about the moment of inspiration, you'll discover that it's not logical. It's nothing to do with logic. It's to do with some idea that sometimes come in, comes in from left field and they become very famous and some of them actually feel they don't deserve it because they don't really feel it was their idea. It just seemed to come to them from somewhere else. Well, so let's uh, take some questions. I was just going to say, speaking yeah. of how little everyone here knows about everything, if you make your way to one of the two microphones, uh, you'll feel free. Hello. Hello. Thank you for being here. Um, so, given that the way that people can produce and create and share comedy, creativity in general, I would love to hear your take on the new having YouTube, et cetera, to produce comedy and produce content, and where you see that going? What well, do I think? don't know, because I don't think anywhere sees it. It's impossible to see what's happening technologically at the moment. And I was thinking just recently how lucky the Monty Pythons were that our two best films were set in historical periods and can't date. And it was an extraordinary piece of luck, because we didn't know, know that that it wasn't, it wasn't intentional. So. Um, Oh, let me think, let me think, let me think. I just don't know what's going on, and I don't understand what's going on. Yeah, by which I mean I sometimes understand the words. Uh, you know, like when people, so there are some people who, who dress up in latex rubber in order to become sexually excited. <laughs> now, I know what all those words mean. <laughs> I mean, the idea that anybody seriously is interested in the Kardashians, <laughs> I'm utterly mystified. You see, and that's how I feel about most of technology. I'm, I'm reading a lot of stuff at the moment about how is it affecting us all. I've certainly come to the conclusion that all this stuff about multitasking has been shown by research and doesn't work. 
it, you get less done and it takes you longer. But people run around talking about the fact they can multitask. So I think we have to look. There's a great book. If you haven't read this book, please read it. Written by a New Yorker. He was a professor of communications. But he liked anonymity, so he'd never say where he was. But his name was Neil Postman, as in mailman. Neil Postman. It's called Technopoly. And I honestly suggest you run out and read it because you'll be absolutely fascinated. Because it's about the skepticism that I feel about technology because people always invent a bit of great technology and they see all the positive benefits. But because we're such flawed creatures, then everyone comes along as a second stage and there's a whole lot of negative benefits. You see, oh, negative whatever. You see what I mean? And people never see that. Sir, ask your question. Uh, I was wondering if you would tell the story of how the Ministry of Funny Walk sketch came about. Oh, yes. Well, I can't because I didn't write it. <laughs> it was presented to me by Mike, uh, Michael Palin and Terry Jones. They'd written it. And they said, will you do it? And I said, uh, yeah, I will. I wasn't very keen on the piece. I never thought it was anything like as funny as everyone else did. <laughs> Seriously. And I remember my disappointment on the theatrical tour of Python when they pleaded with me to do it at the beginning of the tour. And we opened in, where did we open? Southampton. And to my great delight, as I capered around the <laughs> stage, throwing my legs in all directions, to complete silence. <laughs> Utterly humiliating. Uh, when I got off stage, I said, there, see, it's no good. I'm never doing the fucking thing again. <laughs> and they say, one more night. Did you do it one more night? And I did it in Brighton the next night, and the buggers laughed. And I was stuck with it from then on. <laughs> it's quite an energetic sketch. But Mike and Terry came up with Doug, Graham Chapman told a story that uh, there was a person walking by the hedge at your house uh, and his head was aligned strangely, and you came up with the walk that way. No, I don't remember that. You don't remember that. <laughs> Graham had a very tenuous connection with reality. <laughs> <laughs> but he was wonderful. I mean, the funniest thing, I mean, this is absolutely true what he did. The Oxford Union at Oxford University was a place where um, all the British prime ministers came through the Oxford system, and they all did these speeches in the great chamber and they all pretend to be politicians. They're about 19, you know, and they put waistcoats on and they stand like that and they pontificate. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. Anyway, they decided to have a, a, a big debate, high profile on nuclear disarmament, and they invited Graham because he was a bright and very educated guy. And they invited, there, were, uh, there was a general there and there were a couple of politicians there and a couple of top television pundits. And Graham turned up for this extremely important debate dressed as a carrot. <laughs> so you have a general sitting next to a guy dressed as a carrot. And when it was his turn to speak, he got up and refused to say anything. He just stood there for 12 minutes. Of course, the Oxford people got very upset because they felt they'd be losing dignity. And they were shouting rude stuff at him. And he just stood there for 12 minutes and then sat down really proud as he <laughs> ruined the debate. He was an extraordinary chap. Uh, yes, sir. I was wondering if you could comment on uh, the differences of senses of humor between British audiences and American audiences. Yes, I don't think it's that great, you see, but then you immediately get into sense of humor. One of the things you realize is that people's sense of humor is much more subjective and much more individual. When I do my stage show, I show these clips on the screen, and from the light of the screen, I can watch the first four rows. And what's extraordinary is how different their reactions are. One guy over here will be falling about. One while he will look as though he's just been told he's got cancer. But two or three people will be smiling quite in an amused way. Somebody over there is laughing OK, but not falling about. And, this is, and then as you go on watching the stuff, suddenly the silent guy starts to laugh at something that the guy who was falling about doesn't laugh at. So the sense of humor is much more subjective than you think. And the question is, is it funny? Is meaningless? Because what it really says is, do you think it's funny? And when I, when I was do, doing Python with the, with the other guys, I used to say, you know, if we laugh, then we just hope that there's enough people out there who also think it's funny. But we're not going to try and work out, you know, 
and what the demographic is. We're just going to do what we think is funny. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes? Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, this quietness that you discuss, there is this pressure, you know, in whatever we do, to produce very, very quickly. And I see, I think we see that a lot in comedy. There's so much pressure to, to create very frequently. Mm -hmm. um, some people are very gifted improvisers, whereas others succeed more with more long-term projects. But how can we balance that quietness with still pushing ourselves to improvise quickly, to just produce better overall? Well, I once asked a very famous screenwriter, and I'm trying to think of his name, but he wrote Chinatown. Hmm? Robert Town, thank you. I was presenting an award to him. As I was asked if I present an award at a, at a big writer's get-together, writer's award ceremony, which I accepted immediately because I knew there would be no journalists or photographers <laughs> there. And uh, I, I uh, talked to Town, and I said, but, sir, and he was talking about a particular time when they realized the scene didn't work and the pressure was on, and I said, but Robert, how did you manage to produce that brilliant idea under that pressure? And he said, I seem to be able to forget that there's a time pressure. Mm -hmm. Because normally, time pressure makes you anxious. And anything that makes you anxious creatively pushes you back in a stereotypical direction. Do you see what I mean? Because we don't like anxiety, so we do what we can to get rid of it. And if, if, if we go back to what's familiar, we feel less anxious. Do you see what I mean? Yes. So I think the only thing is, if you've got a boss who doesn't understand this, you're fucked. <laughs> you know? But if the boss understands it, then he'll understand why Einstein at Princeton was famous for sitting in his study with his feet on the desk staring out of the window. And it was all right for Einstein. You know, because people were so, oh, he's having profound thoughts. <laughs> but if, if you did that, people would think, lazy person, let's fire it. You see what I mean? <laughs> so it, it's essential in organizations that you have people who understand the process. And I think because of this constant pressure that the people in charge frequently don't understand, anxiety makes people go along more conventional lines. Thank you. Okay. So you have to find a way of cutting yourself off and creating what I call a space by creating boundaries of, of, of time and boundaries of space. I will now be in this, might be the middle of a park. <clears throat> you know, I had a friend at Cambridge, used to go, he had four brothers, he used to go into the toilet when he wanted to think. <laughs> You've got to create a space where you're not going to be interrupted because the interruptions are absolutely fatal for creativity. And you've got to give yourself a certain space of time. And the first thing that happens when you sit down is you start having all these thoughts about things you should have been doing. Should have called Frank. Oh, got to remember to buy that. You see what I mean? And it's like meditation. You have to do it for a time. And then as the thoughts settle, then slowly you get into a calmer, rather nice, relaxed, meditative state, which I like. And that's when the ideas start to come. But you can't do that. That's why I think reading Susan Cain's book about introversion, you can't do that in, a, in, in one of those offices where there's someone every four feet. <laughs> you know? But then who would know that? Because the people in charge have no idea what they're doing, remember? <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'd love to hear about your writing process and how you think about, you know, when you're creating a character, just sort of like the elements. Well, the creating the character, what happens after a time, if you've got a character in mind, is that you start thinking, uh, would he do this? Would he do that? And you think, yes, he would do that. Yes, yes, yes. And you think, no, he wouldn't do that. No, that doesn't feel right. And it's like points on a graph. You begin to find points about, oh, he would do that. And you begin, and he becomes more of a character in your own mind. And then I began to understand that some novelists say, Sometimes they're writing a character, and he, it's almost as though the character they're writing becomes alive and takes the novel over. They sort of have to follow the character. And I think that's what happened. I think when you're an actor doing a, a part, and you're not just playing a stereotypical role you've done before. You try different things, and you think, no, no, ah, that feels right. And you sli slowly build the picture up. 
And as the picture becomes more comprehensive, you feel more and more strongly that this is right for this character and this is not right for the character. Uh, so far as my process is concerned, uh, what's really different from anyone else, because I've talked a bit about the creativity with that uh, young lady we just spoke to, um, what, I, what I think is, is, is so important uh, to do is, is the plot. The story is everything. I can't remember if I mentioned William Goldman, but he was a great friend of mine, and he won two Oscars, um, Butch Cassidy and all the President's Men. And he says, if the story's right, then everything follows. And if the story isn't quite right, then it doesn't matter how brilliant everyone else is, it'll never quite work. So I say, well, if you're writing a comedy, and this is specifically comedy, get a funny story with funny situations. Most people create a story that's not really funny at all, only very, very slightly funny, and then they have to put lots of jokes in. But if you can create a story that has funny scenes, then all you have to do is write the scenes in a reasonably authentic way, and you've got a comedy. So never ask time. Old people sit down at their typewriter and they do scene one. You forget it. Connie and I, when we were writing 40 Towers, we never started to write dialogue until about two and a half weeks into the process, by which time we had a big pad of that sketch paper that you can get in artist material shops, and a plot, because you think of an idea and you think, where would that come? That would come about there, and you write that in there, and you get an idea for the ending, and over two and a half weeks, you've actually got a plot, and then you clean it up a little bit, and then you start writing it. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, I think in the beginning few chapters of your book, you mentioned getting bit by a bunny as a child in a garden. Oh, yes. I thought it was very funny. My first experience of being on a farm was that a rabbit bit me. So I, I didn't finish the book yet, so I'm wondering, maybe you answered this, but does this have any inspiration <laughs> for the, Did for the book Killer Bunny? when I was writing the Holy Grail. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Let's have another one for that. Um, my question would be about whether you think there should be any limits to what is considered comedy and what the role, if any, political correctness should play in comedy. I think political correctness started out as a very good idea, which is let's not make mean jokes, particularly about groups that can't look after themselves so well yet because of their position on the socioeconomic scale. I thought it was a good idea. Then it got extended ad absurdum. And I now think it's become quite pernicious, which is what happens with good ideas if they're taken too far. And I think what we've reached now is a point where anything that seems to be the slightest bit critical of any group or individual is out of bounds. And what people don't understand is all humor is essentially critical. Every joke that's ever been made is about stupidity or prejudice or something like that. Do you see what I mean? It's always critical. Now, th this isn't harmful. People, I was with a wonderful psychiatrist who said to, that the moment that he knew someone in the group was getting more healthy was they started laughing at their own behavior. There was a little daylight between themselves and their ego. So if we can laugh at ourselves, that can't be a particularly cruel thing to do, can it? So to laugh at other people in the, in the, uh, uh, with, with when there's affection around it, it, it is fine. That's what good, humorous, affectionate teasing is about. It's about teasing people gently and pointing things out to them. Now, when it gets nasty, not only is it nasty, but they'll never listen to you. But if teasing is done in an affectionate way, then people can hear the, the implicit uh, criticism that's in there. And it's at an acceptable level. Is that a Absolutely. Thank yeah? you. Yeah? Yeah. I, I mean, is, I guess the question would be like, is there, is it a distance thing? Is it a time thing? Oh, there is a time yeah. thing. That's a very good point. You're absolutely right. I mean, um, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right because time ameliorates everything, you know. And we can now, I remember at school people said, <clears throat> Oh, God, it was like the Black Hole of Calcutta in there. Now, I don't suppose you've ever heard of the Black Hole of Calcutta, but it happened during the Indian Mutiny, the British call it, and the uh, Indians call it the First War of Liberation. And um, some Indians, um, I mean Asian Indians, put uh, 
some uh, British people into a very, very small room, and there was so little space or air that many of them suffocated. Now, that's not something we can laugh at, but a hundred years later, people were saying it was like the black hole of Calcutta. Do you see what I mean? So that as, as time goes away, as time passes, we feel more distant, so we can make things worth it, make, make things. I don't think, uh, well, an example which I thought was terribly funny was, um, did I tell him of that? I wasn't listening. No, well, I've done four <laughs> interviews this morning. <laughs> it reminds me of my favorite psychiatrist joke, you know? The guy says to a psychiatrist, but how do you do, how do you manage to sit there all day with people moaning about their problems and being miserable and unhappy and telling them how they want to kill themselves. And the psychiatrist says, who listens? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for laughing. I thought it was funny. This is a slightly weird audience. I, I never, ever quite know what you're going to laugh at. <laughs> well, I, unfortunately, I think that's all the time we have. Oh, all right. Never mind. One more question. Oh, no, there's Someone no come up with one. a question. All I'd say is get Neil Postman's book, Technology, <laughs> and read something of Rupert Sheldrake, because um, the people who think they know everything scientifically, they don't. <laughs> All right. Thank you. 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 Thank you.